emotional moment between father and daughter as the time approaches for tonight's keynote address from President Biden. A remarkable scene here in Chicago in a convention hall that was supposed to be his big stage. Instead, Kamala Harris destined to be the party's nominee, but not before this love letter, this adoration for President Biden is sent from this crowd. courageous heart, along with Hunter and our entire family, and especially our rock, Jill. For as those of you who know us, she still leaves me both breathless and speechless. Everybody knows her. I love her more than she loves me. She walks down the stairs and I still get that going boom, boom, boom. <laughs> You all will know me. No, no, I'm kidding. Let's give a special round of applause to our First Lady, Jill Biden. My dad 
My dad used to have an expression, for real. He'd say, Joey, family is the beginning, the middle, and the end. And I love you all. Folks. And America, I love you. Let me ask you. Let me ask you. Are you ready to vote for freedom? Are you ready to vote for democracy and for America? Let me ask you, are you ready to elect Kamala Harris and Tim Waltz, President and Vice President of the United States? My fellow Democrats, my fellow Americans, nearly four years ago, in winter, on the steps of the Capitol, on a cold January day, I raised my right hand and I swore an oath to you and to God to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution and to faithfully execute the office of the President of the United States. In front of me, in front of me was a city surrounded by the National Guard. Behind me, a capital just two weeks before had been overrun by a violent mob. But I knew then, from the bottom of my heart, that I knew now there is no place in America for political violence. None. You cannot say you love your country only when you win. In that moment, I was looking to the past, I was looking to the future. I spoke of the work at hand, the moment we had to meet. It was, as I told you then, a winter of peril and possibility, a peril and possibility. We're in the grip of a once in a century pandemic, historic joblessness, a call for racial justice long overdue, clear and present threats to our very democracy. Thank you. And yet, and yet I believe then, and I believe now, the progress was and is possible. Justice is achievable. And our best days are not behind us, they're before us. Now it's summer. The winter has passed. And with a grateful heart, I stand before you now on this August night to report that democracy has prevailed. Democracy, democracy has delivered, and now democracy must be preserved. You've heard me say it before, we're facing an inflection point, one of those rare moments in history when the decisions we make now will determine the fate of our nation and the world for decades to come. That's not hyperbole, I mean it literally. We're in a battle for the very soul of America. 
I ran for president in 2020 because of what I saw in Charlottesville in August of 2017. Extremists coming out of the woods, carrying torches, their veins bulging from their necks, carrying Nazi swastikas and chanting the same exact anti-Semitic bile that was heard in Germany in the early 30s. Neo-Nazis, white supremacists, and the Ku Klux Klan, so emboldened by a president then in the White House that they saw as an ally. They didn't even bother to wear their hoods. Hate was on the march in America. Old ghosts and new garments, stirring up the oldest divisions stoking the oldest fears, giving oxygen to the oldest forces that they long sought to tear apart America. In the process, a young woman was killed. When I contacted her mother, I asked about what happened. She told me. When the president was asked what he thought had happened, Donald Trump said, and I quote, there are very fine people on both sides. My God. That's what he said. That is what he said and what he meant. That's what I realized. Had listened to the admonition of my dead son. I could not stay in the sidelines. So I ran. Because I had no intention of running again. I just lost part of my soul. But I ran with a deep conviction. In America, I know and believe in an America where honesty, dignity, decency still matter. In America where everyone has a fair shot and hate has no safe harbor. An America where the fundamental creed of this nation, that all of us are created equal, is still very much alive. And a broad coalition of Americans joined with me. 81 million voters voted for us. More than any time in all of history. Because of all of you in this room and others, we came together in 2020 to save democracy. As your president, I've been determined to keep America moving forward, not going back, to stand against hate and violence in all its forms, to be a nation where we not only live with the and but thrive on diversity, demonizing no one, leaving no one behind, and becoming the nation that we profess to be. I also ran to rebuild the backbone of America, the middle class. I made a commitment to you that I be a president for all Americans, whether you voted for me or not. We have done that. Studies show the major bills we have passed actually delivered more to red states than blue. Because the job of the president is to deliver to all of America. <laughs> Because of you, and I'm not exaggerating, because of you, we've had one of the most extraordinary four years of progress ever, period. When I say we, I mean Kamala and me. Just think about it. COVID no longer controls our lives. We've gone from economic crisis to the strongest economy in the entire world. Record 16 million new jobs. Record small business growth. 
Record high stock market, record high 401ks, wages up, inflation down, way down, and continuing to go down. The smallest racial wealth gap in 20 years. And yes, we both know we have more to do, but we're moving in the right direction. More Americans have peace of mind that comes from having health insurance. More Americans have health insurance today than ever before in American history. And after, as a young senator beginning to fight, beginning to fight for 50 years to give Medicare the power to negotiate low prescription drug prices, we finally beat Big Pharma. And guess who cast the tie-breaking vote? Vice President, soon to be President Kamala Harris. And now it's the law of the land. Instead of paying $400 a month for insulin, seniors with diabetes will pay $35 a month. The law we passed already includes, starting in January, every senior's total prescription costs can be capped at $2,000, no matter how expensive the drugs they have. And what we don't focus on, and our Republican friends don't seem to understand, our reforms don't just save seniors money, they save the American taxpayers money. You know what we just passed saves? It saved $160 billion over the next decade. That's not hyperbole. It's because Medicare no longer has to pay those exorbitant prices to the big pharma. But look, well, thank you Kamala too.